Well, thank you for coming along to the last of the seven panels that we've had today. We've had um, <coughs> an interesting range of attendances at sessions. Some of them have been packed, but carbon, child protection, and disability, trying to open up access for people with disabilities, are issues which we will continue to address at World Travel Market, but it is hard to get an audience. So thank you very much indeed for coming. It's been videoed by two different organisations, so um, I hope that many more people will see the videos than are here in the room with us today. But the issues which are going to be addressed on the panel over the next hour and a half are very important. And one of the reasons we put it on at the end of the day was to give the extra time so that we can go for an hour and a half rather than the normal hour um, with this session. And that, of course, also means that we can have rather more speakers than we usually do. So we've got a very... Uh, large and well-informed and powerful panel um, for you this evening. At this point, I'm going to hand over to Ross Callendine, who's very kindly agreed to chair this panel. Ross is from Visit England, um, and I'm sure we'll have something to say about Visit England's um, work in this area. But Ross will also introduce the panel, and there should be time for questions, so please, um, please keep your questions for later this afternoon. Thanks very much. Ross, over to you. Excellent. Uh, thanks, Harold, and welcome. Thanks for all joining us today. Welcome to this session, which, as Harold says, is on enabling access for people with disabilities. Um, I am Ross Calladine, Head of Business Support for Visit England, the National Tourist Board here in England, and I lead on our work on accessible tourism and have done for the last five years. I say accessible tourism, but of course you may know it better as tourism for all, barrier-free tourism, disability tourism, responsible tourism, or maybe even social tourism. There really is a whole lexicon regarding this area of tourism. But essentially, we're referring to tourism that meets the needs of people with different physical and sensory accessibility needs. So much time has been spent on researching the size of the market and the value of the accessible tourism market, building the business case. And um, panels such as this one and papers often discuss whether the industry is, is doing enough. But what about the practical solutions? What exactly do tourist boards, destinations, tourism businesses and other stakeholders need to do to successfully ensure that tourism is open and accessible for all to enjoy? This session will explore what can be done to welcome and provide additional opportunities for people with access needs. When Professor Goodwin asked me to chair today's session, I thought it wise to take a look at what the ingredients are for a productive panel discussion. And I read with interest that the ideal number of participants for a session is four to five. Okay, we have seven, but that's okay. The best moderator is someone who has moderated panels in the past. Let's skip over that one. And never let panelists use PowerPoint. Well, apologies, we might have one or two slides today. So we are breaking a few of the golden rules, but I think it's worthwhile. And I also read that the goal of the panel is to be a group of smart, funny people on stage having a dynamic conversation. So no pressure there. And if that wasn't pressure enough, we must strive for a fast-paced, unpredictable conversation between smart people on stage and smart people in the audience. So that's what we're striving for today. No pressure. Our panel today is made up of many esteemed experts in the field of accessible tourism. Um, we have Marina Diatelevi uh, from the World Tourism Organization, Arnold Fuel from AVF Marketing, Tim Gardner MBE from Tourism for All UK, Klaus Lohmann of the German National Tourist Board, Brian Seaman of Access New Business, Chris Veach representing the European Network for Accessible Tourism, and Magnus Berglund of Scandic Hotels. Welcome to you all. So let's make a start. Each of our panellists will present their thoughts and tips on a particular area of accessible tourism. But don't worry, each has been warned that if they break the six-minute time limit or the maximum five-slide rule, they'll be immediately ejected from the world travel market. You're out, sorry. The, the session will then conclude with a panel discussion on the solutions to develop accessible tourism, and your questions will be most welcome uh, at that point of the session, so we would we'll encourage you to think throughout the presentations of what you might want to quiz the panelists on. So I'd like to introduce our first speaker. Marina Diatelevi 
is the Head of Ethics and Social Dimensions of Tourism Programme at the World Tourism Organisation, the lead international organisation in the field of tourism. And Marine is responsible for coordinating the work of the World Committee on Tourism Ethics, a body tasked with monitoring the implementation of the WTO Global Code of Ethics for Tourism by the organisation's 156 members, six associate territories and over 400 affiliate members from the private sector. The promotion of tourism for all and the universal accessibility of the tourism sector are among the various social dossiers managed by her programme. Marina's will focus on how businesses can demonstrate social responsibility through making tourism more inclusive. So, Marina, thank you. Good afternoon. First of all, I would like to thank Harold Goodwin for inviting you and WTO to be part of this panel. Tourism, as you know, has shown over the last few years that it is one of the most effective drivers of economic growth and development, even today in spite of the global economic slowdown. With over one billion travelers in 2012 alone, the sector's expansion has created seemingly boundless wealth of opportunities for economic growth. And with growth come new challenges to which the sector must adapt. Alongside the widely recognized concerns about economic, economic and environmental sustainability, it is crucial that we face the social dimension of this activity and recognize that tourism products and services are not always equally accessible to all segments of the society. The Global Code of Ethics uh, is uh, UNWTO's core policy document, which was, which was endorsed by the United Nations in 2011. It is a ro roadmap on how we in the tourism industry can tread a responsible path, mindful of our responsibility towards our society, our culture, our communities, and our environment. The Global Code of Ethics for Tourism clearly states that tourism should be equally enjoyed by all segments of the society and therefore it explicit, explicitly calls in its Article 7 for the encouragement and facilitation of tourism for all, particularly for pe persons with disabilities. At WTO, we believe that accessibility must be an integral component of the service sector and that it, it requires a systematic integration into tourism, tourist facilities, products, and services, ideally from the inception or through adaptation of existing resources and assets. At this point, I would like to quote our Secretary General, Mr. Talib Rifai, who said that accessibility is a central element of any responsible and sustainable tourism policy. It is both a human rights imperative and an exceptional business opportunity. Above all, we must come to appreciate that accessible tourism does not only benefit persons with disabilities or special needs, it benefits us all. The estimated one billion persons in the world who suffer from some form of disability face serious impediments and barriers when traveling, and as such, their potential as tourists remains largely untapped for the tourism industry. And the demand for accessible tourism is growing, particularly, as we know, during the aging of the world's population. Investment in accessibility can therefore directly benefit private sector companies and businesses. The demand from this emerging segment of population is not only increasing, it is also multi-customer, as each disabled person tends to be a company, it is non-seasonal, uh, especially with reg regards to beach tourism, and it is capable of generating high income and a higher income than the average uh, for conventional tourism. By actively engaging with this particular segment of the market, companies are striving 
to create and sustain a high quality tourist product that is accessible to everybody at the same time as they demonstrate their commitment to social responsibility. A company's uh, performance, we know, in relation to the society in which it operates, has become a crucial part of measuring its overall performance and its ability to continue operating effectively. The promotion of an inclusive approach to their operations not only increases satisfaction rates uh, amongst travelers with disability, but has positive benefits for the image of the company. Such an approach also helps maintain quality uh, standards um, and competition in the sector. Furthermore, by working towards accessibility in tourism, it not only benefits companies, it can also be a driving force for supporting local industry and creating new employment opportunities through the provision of necessary equipment and services. To, to, fully, to fully understand the need for accessibility and to recognize its competitive advantage for the private sector, the UNWTO has been working with different disabled persons, uh, people's organizations and other experts in the field, some of them you have on the slide. And we have been working in mainstreaming accessibility within the global tourism agenda. A series of recommendations have been adopted by UNWTO's General Assembly in August this year and are being disseminated to both the public and the private sector. These uh, recommendations um, highlight the need to provide and display clear information on accessibility of tourism facilities and to provide adapted facilities and support services in destination at no additional cost. They have, and we'd also recommend to have trained staff to assist the special needs per of persons with disabilities. And a more technical manual on accessible tourism containing guidelines, indicators, and best practice examples within the sector is, will soon be available. And to enhance the in accountability of tourism enterprises towards corporate social responsibility and responsible and ethical business practices, including in the field of accessibility, UNWTO has launched a campaign seeking to commit the private sector, the ultimate movers and shakers of the global economy, to the principles of the Global Code of Ethics. In September 2011, we formulated the private sector commitment to the Global Code of Ethics for public adherence and signature of private enterprises and trade associations worldwide. In October uh, this year, 175 companies and associations from 23 countries have signed this commitment. By signing, the major operators of these countries, from airlines to hotels to, to tour operators and their associations, have made a public declaration to uphold ethical standards to promote and implement values of responsible tourism championed in the Code of Ethics and also to commit, uh, to report back to the World Committee on Tourism Ethics about the actions, the practical and the concrete actions they have taken uh, in their corporate social responsibility and corporate governance to implement these uh, principles. An important chapter of this, reported, uh, this reporting is dedicated to um, measures put in place by signatory enterprises to ensure universal access to their facilities, products, and services. The first results of this reporting will be available as from next year, 2014. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marina. And our next speaker, straight on to, to Arnold now. Arnold Fuel is the Managing Director of AVF Marketing and AVF Accessibility. Arnold started his career as a hotelier with Trust House Forte and now runs his own marketing consultancy that specialises in the hotel and catering industry. Since 2003, Arnold has been a permanent wheelchair user and campaigner for great customer service for disabled people. Arnold provides mystery visit, guest visits, access auditing, training for hotel and catering staff, and he speaks regularly to engage hotels in the topic and was heavily involved in the caterers campaign called Ramp It Up recently. Arnold will focus on how to reach the accessible tourism market, looking at promoting your product. 
while um, Ross is getting ready, I should actually say um, that the, the chairman of the panel not only has he all those responsibilities, but he's also acting as my remote control uh, for my particular session. It suddenly struck me, of course, that many of you will not realise that I'm actually a permanent wheelchair user because this table actually perfectly um, uh, hides that factor. Um, and what I want to pose a question to you is, do you really want my money? Because the number of times I visit destinations, hotels between three and five stars in particular, where I think there is a huge gap in the accessible market, then I actually question how often have staff been properly trained to understand what's required. So if I could ask uh, uh, Ross to move on. The very nature of marketing means it covers everything, so I am bound to cut across other speakers, for which I apologise. But I believe that the industry needs to have much greater consultation with disabled people. I think it's vital that hotel and destination staff, tourist attractions, actually identify empathy. The number of times I do training, I've been at Shooting Glen yesterday and this morning doing training, the number of times we talk about empathy in uh, the work we do, if we have empathy with disabled people, they will come back time and time again. And it's actually doing your marketing for you. Because disabled people, when they find a hotel or a destination that looks after them, are going to be loyal customers for many years to come. If I could move on. I thought there was a fascinating blog on the World Travel Market uh, website recently that actually gave the example of three O's and obligation, opportunity and ordinary are the stages that we're going to go through for accessible tourism. At the moment we have the obligation of the Equality Act, so we've gone through the first stage. At this moment in time there is a massive opportunity to actually access this market and, growing, and grow it. We're getting older, we're more likely to have impairments in our lives um, and therefore that market is invaluable to the hotel and tourism uh, sector. And I hope, I really do hope that in my lifetime it actually becomes ordinary that the standard of service is the same regardless of whether I have a disability or not. There is a long way to go but that would uh, be my desire. I personally believe, if you're talking about marketing, you can only sell a bad product once. So if the hotel or your destination isn't ready, and by that I mean the staff and the product haven't been sorted out as far as accessibility is concerned, then you are going to fail in that particular area. And it's all about small changes. All the big things have been done. We've got the ramps and the wider doors. But the little changes, like a dimmer switch, so you can alter the light for a blind person or a person with a, a vision impairment. Um, having herbs in the garden uh, so that people can smell the difference even if they can't see them. Um, no carpets in a wheelchair accessible room is absolutely fantastic. And a welcome letter ready for deaf people when they arrive because that could be translated into any language. Uh, that uh, is in the catchment area for that particular destination and we attract new markets. Um, and my concern is the first inquiry that comes into the hotel, the destination, that is often dealt with so badly that the experience goes wrong. So for example, if I'm a wheelchair user and I phone the hotel, I want someone to ask me what, how I would like that room set up because that is a way of marketing to me when I make that initial inquiry. Why don't we have disabled people in photographs? Can you remember any on television? Confused.com had one wheelchair user that they then took off. 25% of the market in this country are either disabled or have a carer. So why do we ignore them? Why do the, you know, the, the, the marketing industry ignore the spending power that I have? I also believe social media has a huge part to play in developing the market. 
Uh, people like Brian, for example, have 3,000 plus followers. It might even be four by now, uh, Brian. But we need to engage through social media to e encourage forums and discussions so that we can grow uh, understanding um, and uh, uh, share experiences of where are the good places to visit, stay and enjoy yourselves. These are the key marketing tools. I'm not going to go into them because others will cover them. But I was talking to a hotel in London, and they had 33 accessible rooms. And when I went on their website, they t there was no indication that they had a single website. And when I spoke to the sales and marketing manager, he said to me, oh, people just phone up. That's just not the case. Whether you're able-bodied or disabled, we actually go on the internet and look at the internet first before um, making a decision. And if there's nothing about accessible rooms, we will stop. I'm glad to say that hotel now has details of its 33 rooms. There is excellent advice provided by Visit England. That's my check in the post job. Thank you. Um, <laughs> sorry, I think one more if uh, we could go forward. Um, uh, Visit England at your service, which gives you loads of information, lots of case studies on how to market your services um, etc. Two that I picked out were awards, because I love awards, and disability shows, and the ability to grow local and national partnerships. Finally, a case study. This is one great George Street that won the Accessible Katie this year. It's a grade two listed building. It has um, steps into the building that are 100 years old, but it managed to create um, a situation where the stone and the marble steps go backwards and actually reveal a wheelchair ramp to take a, a wheelchair lift to take you up into the building. Because of that investment, and of course it would be the Institute of Chartered Engineers, they would be the people to do it, but the serious point is they won the right to host the International Media Centre for the London 2012 Games. I know what their sales figures are, but um, I'm not allowed to repeat them because of the IOC rules. But they in increased sales and profitability substantially. If ever there was a great example of a business case for a destination in a grade two listed building, this is it. If you ever get a chance to go and see the lift, go. And my final comment is, I wish we could get rid of this symbol. Thank you. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you, Arnold. Uh, we'll go straight on. I'd like to introduce Tim Gardner. Now, Tim is the Vice Chair of the Charity Tourism for All UK, and Tim has worked in the hotel and catering business for many years in senior director positions with both Forte and Granada. For the last 10 years, he's been devoting his energies in the voluntary sector and is currently Vice Chair of Tourism for All UK and of the Chair of the Accessible Tourism Stakeholders Forum, which the Department for Culture, Media and Sport set up um, pre the, the Olympic Games. He was appointed an MBE in 2012 for his services to tourism, and I'd like to thank Tim for focusing on the need for disability awareness and providing a warm welcome. Thank you, Tim. Just taking up Arnold's last point about the wheelchair sign, um, I entirely agree with that. Um, in the UK, there are surprisingly only 1.2 million wheelchair users compared to 9 million um, um, people who are hard of hearing or deaf and 2 million with sight impairments. Um, <clears throat> as Ross says, I've worked in the industry uh, all my life, really, um, so far. <laughs> And um, apart from that, I'm a pretty good customer as well because my younger son was born with cerebral palsy and is a full-time wheelchair user. And when he was younger, he also had um, behavioral difficulties, which is another impairment. So I have first-hand knowledge on what it's like to be in the tourism industry trying to buy products and use my money. Um, Richard is now 28 and is a very active person and gets out and does an awful lot. But when he was younger, he was an embarrassment to take, uh, to be honest, to restaurants and hotels. Not an embarrassment to us, but an embarrassment to 
the, the staff and the management of, of the places we visited. Um, I can remember on one occasion we went in, a party of four of us, to have a meal in a restaurant, and, which was quite busy, and we were taken right to the back of the um, restaurant where there was nobody else sitting. It was dark, uh, it was curtained off, and I said to the restaurant manager, what, what, why have we got to sit here? And he said, well, I've, I thought you'd be more comfortable. Uh, it was really shocking. Uh, on numerous occasions, um, when we were giving a, a food order, the staff would say to me or to my wife, um, what does your son eat? And I said, well, why didn't you ask him? You know, it, it's, it's, a, it's a permanent problem. I'm glad to say the world is changing for the better in this respect. Um, and I'm passionate about the fact that we must welcome disabled people uh, more confidently. And that's where I think staff can be trained uh, very uh, inexpensively compared to putting in you know, major um, room refurbishments or uh, ramps, which can be expensive. But by training your staff in disability awareness, it's the quickest, the most cost-efficient and cost-effective of meeting the needs of disabled people. I have a simple uh, code uh, which encapsulates uh, the training that I run through Tourism for All, which is online and meets the needs of hotels, restaurants, and sales offices. Um, and it's, it's basically three parts. Firstly, is assessing if a person has an impairment. That can be done by looking, by asking questions, um, either face-to-face -face or over the phone if it's through a, a sales office. And not being embarrassed by what answers might be given. So often I say to people, it's just a matter of common sense how you deal with people with impairments. It's not difficult. The second part of my code is by asking the customer what their needs are. If they're a blind person, do they need you know, a, a room which is well lit or an area in, in a in, in, a, um, in a restaurant which is better lit and more easily um, to get around. And the third point of, of my code, which is in our training package, is simply deliver, delivering high quality service. So I say um, whether people are mobility impaired, hearing impaired, visually impaired, or many of the other impairments. By the way, 70% of impairments are not actually visible, which is a, a major factor that people don't realize. I have an impairment, but I don't think any of you probably uh, can recognize that. And if you ask me, I'll tell you about it. Um, so it's a matter of training staff, giving them the confidence, giving them knowledge, and you're halfway there, you're three quarters of the way there. Yes, the ramps have still got to be built, the, the doors have got to be widened, they're expensive, but by training your staff quickly and effectively, you're, you're going to get there. Uh, you're going to get your uh, satisfied customers. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Tim. And moving straight on, I'd like to now introduce Klaus Lohmann. He is the director of the German National Tourist Office for the UK and Ireland. Uh, born in Emsland, northern Germany, he's lived in the UK now for four years, but his career has taken him all over the world, and you probably know what's coming, Klaus, because you, you probably wrote this in your biography. Uh, he's a keen maritime and sailing enthusiast, and over time has sailed to almost every continent on Earth. He joined the GNTO in 2009, uh, where he moved to London with his family. And with his team in London, he's established one of GNTO's most prominent campaigns, Discover Germany Barrier Free a multimedia campaign and specialist tourism website now available for accessible travel in Germany. So Klaus will focus on the role of national tourist boards and the role that they can take to uh, advance accessible tourism. Thank you, Klaus. Guten Tag, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Klaus Lohmann, and as the director of the German National Tourist Office, UK and Ireland, 
I respectively, we are responsible to promote Germany as a travel destination. Thank you very much indeed for having me, having us, Victoria Keim, our PR manager sitting also here today to introduce our barrier-free campaign. We feel proud and privileged to be part of it. The UK and Ireland is a very important source market for Germany. And did you know Germany is the second most visited destination by Europeans ahead of France, just behind, just behind Spain? Europeans made 45.8 million trips to Germany last year, an increase of 7.3% on the previous year. From an incoming perspective, Germany is having a moment and is getting more and more popular. Since the World Cup in 2006, the world realized that we love to laugh about ourselves, love to have parties with us, with, with partners, and we love to welcome visitors. And the reputation of Germany changed rapidly. We have, by the way, we love statistics. If you need statistics about Germany, we have them all. They are waiting to be picked up at our stand, so just forgive me if there are some figures involved. And I'm pretty sure I will make the eight minutes sharp. <laughs> <laughs> Accessible travel is a high-profile focus for us. The idea of developing a new specific website and an ongoing campaign first came us in 2011. The aim was to create a specialist accessible travel website as part of a larger campaign, an ongoing multimedia campaign to help rise awareness in the travel industry, among consumers, and to keep accessible travel top of mind. In Germany, this is called barrier-free. It means free of emotional as well as logistical barriers. It seemed immediately essential to work close with UK experts, such as Brian, such as Tourism for All, who could help us to improve what we already are doing through our head office in Germany. A conversation in our office at the end of 2012 led us to our first full round table meeting in February 2013, followed by a larger working group in May 2013. Us not wearing the hat of Germany, just thinking how we could push forward, create more awareness of the theme itself. Made up to travel expert leading disability charities, universities such as the Surrey University, journalists, barrier-free specialists, advisors, official organizations like our embassy and German partners, and we have wonderful partners who are committed to barrier-free. See, meet Frankfurt at our stand, meet Düsseldorf at our stand. And the idea is of focusing on this, well, we have nine partners involved in this campaign, on the good and the, 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 the wonderful hotels who are, in, who are already dedicated to this topic. So it's like a push and a pull strategy. It's a push strategy to push awareness and to pull, to pull ger more German partners to be part of it. The campaign and website was launched on the day of our annual press conference in September this year. It was also the day of our German travel show, so it received even more prominence with trade and media partners alike. www.german.travels forward slash barrier free is a new one stop shop, and thank you very much for your wonderful feedback we just, I just got. That provides all the information needed from just one sort. It's free for trade partners to, to participate. And this is how the campaign and website looks like. It's clearly structured. It's where to go, committed nine partners. It's how to book. And this is the beauty as well. We combine partners, German product partners like Frankfurt and UK two operators. You can either book directly online as an individual person or you book through your favorite two operator. And I would like to encourage more two operators to participate as I do speak the same um, as well to the German partners. Now that our website is officially up and running, our vision is towards the future. The spending power of disabled consumers in the UK is between, so we learned, 50 and 80 billions. And do they really want the money? Thanks to Able Magazine for bringing this to our attention. If the travel industry does not embrace accessible travel, it will be to their disadvantage. We will continue to raise awareness of barrier-free travel throughout such events like this, throughout our own funded marketing campaigns and adver ad advertising materials, through a public forum we are hosting at our stand, be invited on Thursday afternoon, 2.30 p.m., um, through the media, through Facebook, through the open debate. So once again, thank you very much indeed for having us, and if you are, 
having more questions here at this hour stand, have a chat with Victoria, and well, once again, thank you very much indeed. Excellent. Thank you, Klaus. Uh, I'd now like to introduce uh, Brian Seaman. Brian's a freelance consultant from Access New Business. He joined them as uh, a consultant in autumn of 2012, having worked for the charity Tourism for All for almost 20 years. Brian's background has included working for both the English Tourist Board and the London Convention Bureau. And he's worked closely with many businesses and organisations that provide specific services to disabled people and also um, has advised on access audits for a number of destinations across England and has reviewed access at many tourism uh, venues across the UK. Uh, Brian's also sat on national committees reviewing criteria that relate to accessibility. And Brian will be focusing today on how venues can make physical facilities more accessible and provide aids and equipment uh, to, to make um, travel and tourism more accessible. Thank you, Brian. Spot yours on there, Brian. Sorry, sorry, bear with us. Talk amongst yourselves one second. Just whiz this in here. Oh, that's it. Is that it? Is that it? No, that's, that's for words. Oh, where's, that one? where's the that PowerPoint? That one? Uh -huh. Excellent. Thanks, Brian. Up and down on the bottom, sir. Yeah. On the right. Okay. Hello, and uh, thank you very much for coming this afternoon. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say thank you uh, to Professor Harold Goodwin for inviting me to speak today, and to all of you to come here to listen uh, for a very few brief words that I have to say. Um, thank you, Ross, for the kind introduction. Uh, thank you for the kind words from other panel members. I've been around a long time, and I know I look like it these days. Um, but I, I spend a lot of time uh, out on the road in the past 20 years uh, looking at facilities and services, and uh, have worked with alongside disabled people uh, throughout those years. And I've listened to thousands of people and the issues and concerns that they have so that I can then address those to the tourism industry and encourage them to do better. Uh, that's the point, really. Um, Access New Business is a group of self-employed professional advisors with specific experience in accessible tourism. We offer access advice for individual businesses as well as destinations. Today I've been asked to, to come up with some top tips for improving access to tourism services, particularly using equipment and devices to assist guests or visitors. When we talk about improving access to tourism services, what do we mean? This all-embracing phrase means providing a welcome to all visitors or guests and anticipating their requirements in advance. It is one of the obligations for businesses in Britain under the Equality Act 2010. Okay. What I'm going to do is go through some devices that you may or may not be familiar with, some you will recognize, and these are particularly for people um, who are deaf or hard of hearing. Um, number one is a portable hearing loop. Um, you may see these around the center here at Excel, and they'll assist hearing aid users to hear a conversation more clearly, and can be provided at counters in reception areas, can also be used elsewhere, such as small meeting rooms, so portable's quite good. Number two is a deaf guard or vibrating pillow pad, which can be used in bedrooms to waking guests uh, who are deaf or hard of hearing when the fire alarm is activated. Being wireless, it can be used in any, any property where an audible alarm is provided. Number three is a helpful item for people with a hearing loss. It's a simple device that clips on a, to a door using a hanging bracket. It detects the vibration of someone knocking at the door and it activates a flashing light to alert that someone has, cannot hear that there is someone at the door. A big button phone, oh sorry, it's just jumped. Take your pardon. 
<laughs> Sorry. There's me leaning on the lean, leaning on the computer that does it. Um, number four is a big button telephone, uh, which is compatible with hearing aids, uh, and that will aid many users, including being able to increase the volume. Number five uh, is an example of how modern technology can help. Uh, this is a handheld British sign, sign language guide available for tours at the Roman Baths in Bath. And number six is, uh, is a subtitled option on video and film. Uh, this particular image is taken from the introductory film for visitors to Knoll House at Seven Oaks in Kent. Uh, as you may be able to see, this also includes a BSL or British Sign Language interpreter in one corner. So how do you improve tourism services for people who are blind or partially sighted? Here are a few suggestions. And you might begin to see uh, something that pops up uh, on a regular, regular occasion through these few slides. Um, first of all, and it's easy to, is to have large, clear print. Um, black on yellow is very helpful. Um, yellow is the last color, generally speaking, that people see um, when they go blind. So um, the, the point of having black on, uh, black on yellow is quite helpful from that point of view in that it covers the most people. If you look at the signs on the underground, for example, you'll notice that they're yellow and black. And on buses, they're yellow and black. And that's for that reason, in case you ever wondered. That's a useful thing for your Christmas quiz. Um, number two is, is about signage. Good signage in key areas such as public WCs and lifts will help those who have a greater loss of sight. The example includes uh, tactile and braille information. Number three, you may not have seen before, but is a simple liquid level indicator that is used to measure the level of water in a cup. And it's particularly helpful if this is boiling, boiling water for tea or coffee. It emits a warning when the correct level is reached. And it saves putting your finger in boiling water and said, is that cup full yet? Because you get a bit of it. It does hurt a bit. Number four, big button phone again. Um, again, will aid many people having larger buttons and numbers will assist those who cannot see very well. Number five is an easy thing for most businesses to do, and that's to highlight the nosings of steps for those who cannot see individual steps clearly. <coughs> very easy thing to do. And another simple thing that's being done on uh, room key cards is to put a small notch on the key card at, on one end so you know which way to insert the key into, into the locks if you're blind or partially sighted. That will help you know which way around to put the card in. Save you standing there for hours just doing this. So coming on to mobility. Uh, here are some devices and equipment that might aid people. Um, the provision of a sign, sorry, just des designated parking uh, and signage as close as possible to an entrance will assist those with mobility uh, requirements. And having a sign together with a push button or bell uh, to, to gain assistance to help with luggage uh, or getting into the hotel is a really good idea. And all these are examples from things that I've seen when I've been on my travels around the United Kingdom. Handrails at steps uh, will help people who have difficulty walking, especially if they use a walking stick. And this, could, this would be uh, handrails on both sides of the steps. If you're using a, a stick, you're going to need a handrail on the opposite side, travelling in the opposite direction, if you see what I mean. Twin bedded rooms, I don't know how many people have thought about this, but um, some people travel with a carer or enabler, the person they don't sleep with, but who goes with them in order to assist them throughout their, their, their travel. And it's useful to have the same person in the room. Uh, some people may need turning in the night to prevent bed sores, for example, so the carer needs to be in the same room as the person who's being looked after. Again, a big button phone uh, has a hands-free operation. So if you've got problems with mobility, then it's a really easy thing to do uh, if you have dexterity or mobility difficulties. And finally, uh, number six, uh, seating with armrests will assist people with mobility issues who may find it difficult to sit or stand without armrests for support. So these are just an illustration of some of the simple steps you can make to provide a more welcoming environment for millions of disabled and older people and are already, really, already being provided at many tourism-related businesses up and down Britain. They are ready to accommodate an ageing population. Are you ready too?
If you have any questions or you'd like to contact me afterwards and after the question session, um, then please do. All my details are on the screen. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Thank you, Ross. Excellent. Thank you, Brian. Uh, I think everyone can take some, some tips away from Brian's presentation. Um, I, I think the notch on the key card is something that, at no cost, very t relatively simple for any hotel to do, but could make such a difference for people. So some great takeaways in that, in that presentation, Brian. I'm going to move on, and I'm going to introduce uh, the first of our last two speakers, uh, Chris Veach. Chris is a travel and tourism consultant specialising in product quality, customer care, accessible tourism, and social inclusion. Uh, his portfolio of work has included playing a key role in the development and delivery of the then English Tourism Council's accessibility strategy, uh, notably working on the National Accessible Scheme and the access-related specifications for, for the website and a project called EnglandNet. Chris has extensive European experience, acting as UK project manager for the pan-Europe EU-funded ASATE project, which some of you may be familiar with. And this provided digital information on accessible tourist accommodation and attractions across Europe. Chris is a founding member of the European Network for Accessible Tourism and participates in ENAT's research, training and business development programmes for destinations and enterprises. Chris has co-authored chapters in a number of accessible tourism books. I'm delighted that today he will be focusing on the importance of information provision. Thanks, Chris. Good afternoon. Thank you very much. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, and I'm grateful for the invitation to be able to speak. Regretfully, I break all the rules. Um, I have a PowerPoint. There's more than five slides, and I'm neither witty nor amusing. So please bear with me. Um, information, information. It's really important. Uh, this comes from a, a Visit Scotland report, but I've seen this uh, very often. People, disabled people say, accurate information gives you the power of choice, which we don't have at the moment. Uh, and I think one of the things that strikes me about this is actually that there's nothing unique about this. It's true for everybody. Accurate information is important for everybody. But it becomes particularly important for disabled people, of course, because it can make the difference whether they uh, visit or not. And also, when they do turn up, if that information isn't accurate, there are nasty surprises. So I often say, mind the gap between marketing promise in terms of what you're telling people and what your information supports in terms of marketing and the actual experience. They need to be seamless. So what's particularly important for people with access needs? What, uh, what do they need? And in fact, again, I say all of us uh, uh, require these things, but they're particularly important for disabled people. So we need easy-to-find information. I don't know if you're like me. I'm a really bad-tempered web user. If I have more than two or three clicks to find something, give up, go home, forget it. You haven't got my business. I'm on the move. So easy-to-find information. Now, I would also say... Try and avoid the word disability and disabled in terms of when you're providing information on a business or a destination website. You're narrowing it down, you're limiting it. Accessible, accessibility, broader terms should be used to encompass a much wider order, a potential audience. So easy to find information and easy to navigate through uh, when you're looking at website or a brochure, but people need to be able to find that information easily. It needs to become available in accessible formats. So, again, the key thing about, and it's, again, no different to any other consumer, it's about giving people choices. We want choices. We're told us today, you know, we have choices. So, offer consumers alternative formats. It may be large print, maybe audio, maybe web, maybe printed, maybe braille, but think about the different formats that you can make your information available in to a different and a wider audience you're wanting to reach out to the widest potential audience to make the most of the opportunities that you have to reach them. Because that information is going to be their decision maker, whether they come to you or not and spend their money with you or not. You need reliable information. So if you're a destination or a business and you're using third-party information, yeah, flag it up where that information is coming from because that can give assurance to people. They know that organisation. They trust that organisation. It's reliable information because, again, linking it with accurate Information needs to be accurate and coming from a source that's trusted. 
uh, no nasty surprises on arrival. I hate nasty surprises on arrival. So, uh, Information also needs to be up to date. So ensure where possible information is dated because there's nothing worse than looking at a website that you think is current and then it turns out that actually uh, it's not. Now, where do we get information uh, from? Um, there are... I've identified here uh, four key sources, I think, for accessibility information. Uh, one key source comes from standards, and standards can be very useful for disabled people. Some hate them, some like them, but nevertheless, they can be useful, I believe. Standards offer the opportunity to have real assurance. So it can be a set criteria that a business or destination is, is meeting, um, a set of standards that uh, are then assessed independently, and then there can be a mark or a seal or some recognized uh, 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 set of standards that people say, yes, I can see instantly that's going to be suitable for me to go to. Accessibility information, uh, I'll come on to that in a little bit more detail, I'll talk about that, but that's in terms of giving some top-level information that can be searched through, that visitors can, potential uh, customers can think, yep, I found something here, I want to perhaps know a bit more, but on the face of it, it looks suitable for me. An access statement is, I think, a really invaluable tool because it allows a business to paint a picture, to give real depth to what they can offer a, a, a customer in terms of the facilities, uh, the building, the environment, uh, and really help to, uh, to entice and, and bring people in. And, of course, the, the last one is the inquiry, that telephone call. Because often what you'll have is people may see the website, they may look at the access statement, but they want still confirmation or further detail that may not be there. And that access statement also becomes a useful training tool. So it should be by that phone, staff should be familiar with it, able to answer any questions. And if there's things that aren't there that are being raised, then again, that should tick about in the head and say, right, that needs to be added to our access statement. Because these things are never static. Information is never static. It can always move and be added to through experience. So this is an example of access information. Ross mentioned I worked on the Asate project. That was the one-stop shop for accessible tourism in Europe. We really like short and handy clippy names, don't we? Um, but Asate basically um, was... Th th there were two levels that came out of that. One was a full-assessed uh, information data system. The other was a self-assessed system, which Visit England took up, and um, at uh, regional level businesses would provide lots of different uh, bits of data about their business to their destination management organization. But we added to that these various fields, which they, are set, they went round and they ticked uh, uh, themselves, and then this was added to their information, went onto the website, and was searchable. So, for example, you can see here, it's not all about uh, certain disabilities of wheelchair. It's also about um, provisions for dietary needs, requirements. I have friends who are, they're so frustrating to go on holiday with, not because they're awful people, but because they are, they, they have restricted diets. And finding places that can serve them really hard. Whereas if you've got information like this, you can find it quickly and, and easily. So an access statement, an invaluable tool. Um, I'll just read this as a description. An access statement is a description of a business facilities and services to inform people with access needs. So it is very much about a descriptive approach to writing a business. It's about, it's about telling a story of your business. And that starts with the outside environment. It's about the transport to get to you. Outside, is it on a hill? Are you on a flat? Coming in, the car park, are there accessible spaces? Is it well lit? The entrance, any steps, handrails, taking them into the reception area, if, there is a, if it's a hotel or something. Um, what's the lighting like there? Have you got low counter facilities? Are there stairs? Is there an alternative lift? Dining facilities, bedrooms. If you're an attraction, what's your gift shop like? So it's about taking people through a story of your business and describing that to them. It's not about making statements whether you are accessible or not. It's about stating what is there. Because then again, it comes back to the individual to make that decision whether it's suitable or not. And they may well then make a phone call as well, as I say, to decide if it is or not. 
Now, I just wanted to show you this because this is a, uh, a, a tool that Visit England has developed. It's an online tool for businesses to use. And I think it actually just encompasses the four pro bits of process that a business will ha would have to go through anyway, whether they use this tool or not. It's a really useful tool. And a number of businesses uh, are catered for in this, large and small accommodation, tractions, uh, football um, uh, 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 stadiums, uh, wildlife parks, pubs, cafes. So there's a whole range of different businesses that can use this tool. And basically, uh, it has a structure that it's, it is structured in terms of the story that I was mentioning earlier. So it's about the external environment, uh, the entrance, and then taking you through the public areas and then the various uh, areas that you're covering. So you would print off this template, and you could even produce one even if you didn't use this tool for yourself. Then walk around the business and gather information. Key thing, I think, is involving staff. The other thing, I think, is involving disabled people. Involve where you can staff and various people who have got understanding of access issues. They can have a valuable input into this process. And then you would go online, you would complete the access statement, uh, and then, of course, you make it available on your website, clearly in marks, of course, and uh, available in alternative formats, ideally. The key thing with an access statement, I think, is see it as a marketing tool. Uh, I do see um, access statements that regretfully adopt the position sometimes that access shouldn't be sexy, um, and it's dull, and it's boring, and of course it isn't. It's a very, very important marketing tool. So brand it up, make it attractive, Within the access statement, ideally there should be really good quality photographs because a photograph can say more than words can sometimes. It allows people to see the product. And floor plans as well. Floor plans are invaluable for people to be able to see the layout and, and help them uh, navigate their way through a business. I'd like to just flag up two publications there that are Visit England uh, publications but are quite useful. The one on the left, Winning More Visitors, that's for destinations and gives some hints and tips about uh, what content uh, destinations should be looking to provide on their websites and uh, advice on, on uh, accessible information within their websites. And Speak Up is a tool aimed at small businesses uh, looking to reach the market. So it's about the different channels that you can use to actually reach markets and about information provision as well. So thank you very much. Thank you. Was I over time? Did I stick to time? <laughs> Thank you, Chris. That, that was an excellent presentation. You'll now be ejected from World Travel Market for, for going over your time. But no, I'm really glad that we, we did let you go over with that. Um, we've got one more presentation uh, by, by Magnus. Uh, I'd like to introduce Magnus. He's from Scandic Hotels. Uh, Scandic is widely acknowledged as one of the world leading hotel chains with regards to accessible um, tourism has around 160 hotels in eight European countries. And Magnus has been central in developing Scandic's experience to include accessibility in the normal business um, on a day-to-day -day basis. Scandic's slogan is, everyone is welcome at Scandic. So I'd like to pass over to Scandic, uh, sorry, pass over to Magnus even, uh, who will take you through his presentation. No. Oh, you haven't got PowerPoint. No, have I'm sorry. No? You said no PowerPoint, so then no, that's fine. <laughs> Thank you. <coughs> Hello, uh, my name is Magnus Bolden, and I'm charged for disability question for Scandic Hotels, and uh, we have 160 hotels in eight countries. Uh, why is it not? Why is not every hotel change and every every really industry working with disability questions? Why? I can tell you really why, because when I'm around, uh, around in the world in education or speaking, I'm always asking, why should Scandic Hotel working with accessibility questions? And I'm getting so many answers, so many answers. Yeah, it's social responsibility, it should be accessible for all, uh, it's nice if people uh, that is blind can come in, it's nice. I hear so many different things. But if I change the question, why should we have a hotel for healthy people? I only get one answer. We want to make money. That's why you have a hotel or anything. That, that's why you have it, because you want to make money. But so fast we start to speak about disability. Yeah, the, yeah, we do that something. I mean, 
that's, that's really the big problem. In Scandic, we have really one goal. We should not have any disabled people at all at Scandic. We only should have guests. You always need to see you are a guest. So is it very many people that are sitting in a wheelchair or many people that don't hear so well or so on? We need to see what is the business case. We need to put it in the business case every day. So in Scandic, we try to include it in everything we're doing. Everything from we have our own standard on 110 points. We have 80 points on the website on every hotel we're telling how it looks like. And everything that this panel have telling here about before, many things that is don't need to cost lots of money. It don't keep, I mean, we are building, the last 15 hotels we have built, we are building one hotel, we build 60 handicap rooms, we build 10 handicap rooms, we have a reception disc that is lower, and everything like that. Didn't, we didn't put in any more money in the budget. No more money in the budget. We are putting in disability questions in the budget we already have. So we don't need to put in more money to, be, to do it acceptable at all. We just need to start thinking about it. And we many times say, yeah, but the architect didn't do the right thing. It's not the architect's problem. It's the owner problem. If we want a hotel, it's up to us to put down in, into the contract what we want. And that's what we don't doing. So it's very important that we have education, that we start education and put it in, in everything we're doing. We try to education everything from the cleaning people that are cleaning the hotel rooms, because they need to know about accessibility. Because if I come in with a wheelchair and things like that, they need to have putting down uh, uh, the shower chair in the room or, or the shower so we can reach it. But the other thing, if you build a new hotel or renovation big uh, hotel, I can promise you, if we have ordered 100 black shares like that, and they come in green, you have lots of people going to tell us, oh, the share is not right, we need to change it. But if you miss something about disability, no one say anything, because there's so few people that know about it, because we haven't education about it. So we need to put it in every day today. That's things. And things that don't cost money, I have been around now many times here in, in England, and I was here, and when I'm coming to reception here today and everything, you don't have stakeholder. I don't see stakeholder anywhere in England. In the reception, you should have a small stakeholder so I can put my stick, because it always don't fall down. That's costing less than one pound. <laughs> and acceptable is not, I'm just going to take one more minute here, Ross. I hope that's okay. I mean, we're never going to be acceptable for all, never because disability is so different. I mean, you mentioned here before in the panel about, the, uh, about handicap rooms or disabled rooms, and we're building lots of disabled rooms, and we don't have carpet, we only have wooden floor in the rooms. That's very good if you sit in a wheelchair, but that's terrible for me. I want carpet that is so high up, so <laughs> no one can come in. That's good for my legs and my feet, but I'm never going to build that. I'm never going to do that. I mean, the goal need to be so we're building hotels and we're working with the guests so much as possible so we can get so many guests as, as possible. That, that's really need to be the goal. We need to educate and we need to do all the standard. But we not need to listen to just one person. We need to ask in the guest. What I have started to do, as, asking not, I mean, normally you ask asking one organization, yeah, they're saying that's good. Okay, we don't do that with all other things in the, in the industry. Now I'm asking about 1,000 blind people, or I'm asking, I asking 1,100 people in a wheelchair, what do they like about that room, and things like that. Then we're getting somewhere, then we can see the market share, and then we can work with it. That's very shortly about how Scandic is working with these questions. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you, Magnus, and thank you to all of our uh, panellists for presenting. We now have about 20 minutes left of the session, uh, which is really the, the best bit, because we're going to ask you guys to uh, input any questions that you might have for the panel. Um, and also, I'd, I'd like to kick off, really. So we, we've heard a lot of insightful presentations today. Uh, there's certainly a lot of information on, on improving accessibility. But this raises the first question, I think. Um, is the amount of guidance on accessible tourism and possible changes just too overwhelming? Is there, is there too much uh, information out there? And put that to the panel. Who would like to pick up on that one? Brian. 
Um, well, I, yeah, I think um, th there certainly is a lot of information out there, Ross. Um, and I, I can only see that uh, as a good thing. Um, for in England, uh, Ross, as I mentioned, I don't think, uh, there is a national accessible scheme. Um, not only does this help you to identify somewhere that might be suitable for you to stay, and it's a voluntary code, um, it also is available to architects and designers so they can work with those criteria to develop facilities which will meet the need of other people. I don't think, I don't think you can ever have too much information um, in terms of uh, developing accessible facilities. I wonder if any of the other panel have got some thoughts on that. I think it, it's, it's a changing uh, scenario. Um, we, we've come a long way, I think, in the last decade, up until you know, possibly 10 years ago, um, there was relatively little information um, and I think what's happened has been a flood coming from different uh, sources which might be confusing um, and certainly one of the things which I found very confusing is is the use of language you know we, we uh, as has been said I think the word disability is not appropriate and we should try and get that out of our language you know, we have accessible car park spaces we have accessible toilets not disabled toilets mm -hmm. for goodness sake. Um, so yeah, it'd be nice if we could simplify the information. Can we pick up on the, the question there from Arnold that posed at the end about the logo? I mean, the wheelchair logo has become the international logo of disability, but I think it was backed up by another panel member that there are problems with that. Um, our, our stats show that around 8% of disabled people are wheelchair users, and is that the reason why you think the logo is, is, well, is not right? Personally, I'm a great believer. I am a disabled person, but I get out and about. I go all over the country. I run my own business. And like many other disabled people, we run our lives perfectly normally. And I always want disabled people to look at the positive aspects of their lives and not dwell on any difficulties that they may have. And I think having a wheelchair sign is a very negative symbol. And I think the sooner we get rid of it, the better it will be. I'd like to put that out to the, to the audience, if I may. Does anyone have any views on, on that? Magnus first, and then if anyone else I would like to come in. I tried that in scanning for many years ago to take them away, uh, that we had handicap rooms and call it for acceptable rooms, mm -hmm. but on Swedish, and taking away the uh, symbol. I was called down, why don't you have any handicap rooms anymore? <laughs> so, and that was, so I understand what I, I think it's too early in, in, in the world, maybe in the UK, but the, out in the world, that that's exactly what uh, you need. People is checking that that symbol everywhere and parking place and everything. So uh, I think it's uh, it's needed. It, it may be early, but um, I actually phoned up a pub uh, the other day and said, "Do you have any accessible toilets?" And they said, "Oh no." I said, "But I'm a wheelchair. How do you expect me to go to the toilet?" Oh, we've got disabled toilets. She said. <laughs> yeah. 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 Can I take a question from the audience, if I may? Yes, yeah. sir. There's a microphone just coming with you now. Uh, hello, I'm Alan Thomas. I'm chairman of Tax Southfield. I read the charity and I deal a lot with the disability community. Uh, yeah, I agree with Arnold about the symbol for a wheelchair user. Uh, I travel all over the globe and um, I think in the UK we're the only one that has a very negative blue badge. All the rest of the countries I go to is a very sort of encouraging, uplifting badge they use. So it's a case of maybe modernising the logo and it's, it's a bit old fashioned, is that yes, what you're saying? Uh, yeah, I think it's very old fashioned, yeah. Yes, thank you. I would just like to ask the panel then, particularly on, how do you think is the next way to change that? Um, well, I was just thinking, why don't we have a suggestion today coming from the, this forum that Visit England run a competition in schools to actually get children to design the logo to promote accessibility. It will then fit into the curriculum. We can get all sorts of positive messages and it's fantastic PR for Visit England. And I'll send you the bill later, Ross. <laughs> excellent, excellent. <laughs> I think uh, my business plan's just been written for next year now. Thanks, um, thanks I, I should have, I've got a very special offer to anyone. I've got loads of business cards, by the way. <laughs>
question. Does anyone else want to come in with a question? Yeah, question at the back. If we can have the microphone to the back corner, thank you. Thank you. Hello. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. So Elizabeth Mystery, I'm a travel writer and hospitality writer. I'm also a full-time carer. Um, should the five-star newly opened hotel, which I was visiting as a mystery guest, should they have made an effort when I opened the cupboard door to see the hanging rail three foot above my head, which meant I couldn't use it and nor could the wheelchair user I was accompanying use it, should they have made an effort to improve their facilities when I politely drew it to their attention? Or should they have offered us our money back, <coughs> having sold us a DDA room? Brian, I think that's one, one for you to pick up. Um, well, yes, I'm, I've come across this situation myself um, in hotels, and it's a question of education. Um, you can have a, a, hang, a hanging rail and a wardrobe, which can be at different levels. It doesn't have to be in the same place all the time. You just lift it up and then drop it down to another set of fixings on the wall, and then you have a lowered, a lowered hanging rail. So it, is, it's, it isn't rocket science, uh, I'm glad to say. Um, uh, how, you, how you overcome and, um, the issue, though, is to obviously discuss the complaint with the hotel and, see if, um, and, and, and draw their attention to it if you haven't done so already, so that they can then make those changes. When, unless anybody complains and says, you know, this isn't right, and I think you could do it better this way, um, then you know, the hotel will remain the same. Um, so you should take it up with them, and then um, make, you know, maybe they'll offer you a free night. You won't never know anyway. It's worth a try. Is um, it worth just, just also sorry. adding, Brian, that I think from a regulation perspective, am I correct in saying that the building regulations don't go down to that level of detail, the rail in the wardrobe? No, that's correct. They don't, they don't uh, specify that in um, approved document M of the building regulations, although it may well be in British standards, uh, BS 83002009. I can see all your eyes glazing over. <laughs> I think it's in there. Um, but, it, but yes, it's, it, it, generally speaking, it's not in the building regulations as such. There's, a, there's another point, Ross, and uh, my wife goes absolutely bonkers when you actually have um, uh, hanging space that's suitable, it's at wheelchair level, but then the ladies are forgotten because where do you hang your long dresses? So we've actually got to think about the requirements of carers um, uh, and as Brian says there are examples of uh, 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 pull down rails and in answer to your question should that five star hotel have been built correctly the answer is absolutely yes it should have mm -hmm. and I think as a travel writer you should name and shame. Excellent we have a question over here please. Thank you. <coughs> Excellent, thank you. Oh. <laughs> Sorry, can you hear me? Yes, yeah, I can now. Hi, uh, Yashwant Holker, uh, interested in the accessibility space. Um, I have a question for the panel, and thank you for your time. It's been very, very interesting. A lot has been said about uh, the business case behind accessible tourism. A lot has been uh, through conversations at the WTM, etc. Uh, I'd be very interested from each of you to understand what the most relevant, most interesting pushback you have gotten or questions you've gotten, concerns you've gotten from business leaders you've spoken to about the case, because it seems to be so apparent. Why isn't more being done? Thank you. Tim? I, I visit quite a lot of um, chief executives of hotel groups, um, and I visit also a lot of um, small, um, medium-sized enterprises. And I find in the large hotel groups in the UK in particular that um, the subject of accessibility does not exist in the boardroom, and that really concerns me. Uh, there are one or two groups who have got it right in, in the UK, and Scandic Hotels is obviously another fine example, uh, where there are champions in the boardroom who are talking about you know, building projects and making sure that some of these very simple things uh, can be put right. But the culture of understanding uh, accessibility, for me, is not strong enough in the boardroom really like to see that change. Can, can we delve into that a little bit, Tim? I mean, is it easier uh, for Scandic, for example, Magnus, because uh, you are a disabled person and you are a natural advocate for accessibility within the group? Do you think Scandic would have the same approach if you hadn't brought your passion and experience to the organization? Yeah, I'm thinking I would never done this job if I didn't know the hotel business. 
I mean, that, 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 that's basically, I know the whole business and I report in, uh, reporting director to the board. Mm -hmm. So I'm in the budget process, I'm in all the way. Mm -hmm. uh, but I could never done this job if I didn't know how the whole business is working. So I think the big problem is that in all the business about us, why it's not there in the true sector is that you don't have people that is really working that day to day. Mm -hmm. Because you can take in all this good access, you can do that, but when you do the budget, when they are there, when the question is you need to take the decision in one minute, you don't call a consult guy. You don't do that. You need to have. So, so I think that that's the really big problem. You have too little people that work with it in the business. Could I have a few words? Yeah, yeah. Sorry, yeah. just trying to be exciting for other time. I'm sorry, yeah. just, uh, just one second if I can just yeah. wrap, up, wrap up that point. Uh, Chris, Brian, did just you to say, um, I, I had some contact with uh, Juries Inn and Juries Hotels. Um, and one of their directors is a wheelchair user. And I think that helped to focus uh, their minds on what they needed to do to become more accessible. Uh, she's retired now, sadly, but uh, she was there at the time when they were putting in accessible rooms. And I think she had quite an influence on what was being done. Thank you, Brian. Yes, if you take your question. Sorry, yeah. Talking about accessible tourism, and obviously transport is very important. Um, do you think the transport industry, train, coach, aviation, does enough for accessibility? I see some fine examples on um, traveling um, mm. on trains in particular, where uh, people have ordered, you know, uh, sorry, a ramp. A little bit closer. Sorry. Um, so I, it's November the 5th. Um, yeah, I see some fine examples. I see some bad examples as well. Uh, I hear um, Arnold will tell you, I'm sure, about his experiences with, uh, with uh, traveling, because he does a lot. Um, it has got better, um, but you know, it's still got a long way to go. There's a, a, a comedian story which says, um, uh, I'm a wheelchair user. I'm now a fourth class passenger just behind the trolley. <laughs> Arnold, I'd like to um, pick up on something from your presentation. Um, thank you, Magnus. Have a safe flight. Thank you very much. Um, you mentioned that we're at, in that phase, the ordinary. Sorry, we're not. We're in the opportunity phase at the yeah. moment. The question would be, how do the, the audience and the panel propose that we move to the ordinary phase? Um, I think that's going to come down to training. Um, I've just been training uh, 65 members of staff at a hotel in the last two days. And they have gone from the 65% of the general public that is afraid to go to the help of a, someone with a disability, which was identified by BT in research last year. And they've gone from that situation to being confident about actually how to welcome and look after people with disabilities. And I do something that is probably frowned on by other people. I actually get them to experience disability. So there's some, I don't know whether you've seen SIM specs, but they're um, a fantastic array of different glasses that replicate different um, eye conditions, um, getting them to use a wheelchair. The number of people that don't even know how to open and close a wheelchair is incredible. Um, teaching them how to recognize deaf people. And I think training is always going to be at the core of this market. Any other panellists want to say how we can move forward into that ordinary phase? I mean, to answer your question, what means Thanks. enough? You know, it's never enough, but I'm talking about the, the transport system. We easily found uh, Deutsche Bahn, for example, Lufthansa, to be part of our campaign. I mean, there are other not mentioned, so our idea is to mention, to focus on the, well, on the examples uh, we, we, we believe in who are dedicated to be part of it. And I think to answer your question, there's a change going on. There's a global demand and there is a push from the, gov from the government. There's a push from the inside. And so there is a more empathy all over the world. Demographic changes. Yes, I'll take your question. Do uh, hello, my name is Wendy and I graduated uh, on international tourism studies last year. Uh, my graduation subject was accessible tourism and then the information provision. But what I was wondering, also in my last year, I included accessibility in my 
uh, st student reports and everything that we had made for the studies. Why isn't access accessibility more included in the study programs? Like we have like sustainable tourism and all those kind of things and ecotourism and everything. But why not more ac accessible tourism already at the study levels so that people are already aware of it more before they start working in the tourism industry? Um, if you talk to Peter Ducker, the chief executive of the Institute of Hospitality, he will tell you that it's actually in the curriculum, but in a very minor way. But I know that Peter Ducker um, is very keen to bring accessibility very much into the management training. Uh, so, for example, if you go on their website, there are three training videos, um, excuse me, appearing too often, but there are three training videos. So I know that the Institute of Hospitality is very, very keen to actually make this change and bring uh, accessibility very much into the management uh, training uh, that exists at present. And is it not also that um, lecturers on tourism uh, schools are not aware of accessibility? Like when I uh, had my thesis defense, like they were like really, um, yeah, really, they, I opened a new world for them they didn't know about. And so I think that's also a step that still has to be made. Can I, Chris, would you like to come in on I, I agree with that completely. Um, I, I started lecturing, uh, doing a guest lecture at uh, Liverpool University. And uh, I had to do a session for the lecturers themselves as well because they had no concept. So they're teaching accessibility, uh, they're teaching tourism, but they're not actually encompassing within that accessibility. And I think that you could, as you say, you have a unit on sustainability and you focus on that, you could do that within the, with accessibility. But the key thing is integrating it into all the strands. So if you're focusing on marketing, you need to think of the accessible aspects of marketing. If you're thinking of planning and strategy, you need to think of the accessible. So it's actually not an add-on or something we do because we should do and have a unit. It's something that just should be basically natural, integrated, because that is what we should be doing for an inclusive society, but also for successful businesses and successful visitor experiences. Excellent, yeah, one thank you. One last question. What's the best step to make uh, from um, graduating in accessible tourism to find a job in the accessible tourism world? Does anyone know? <laughs> With difficulty, I think. Uh, I would have thought you'd been grabbed up by any destination yeah. that uh, is serious about um, accessibility. Um, I know Visit England, can I mention Jason, and they have a destination forum. Um, your sorts of services where you could actually work uh, with hotels, with venues, with attractions in a city or area, I would have thought would have been absolutely invaluable. Excellent, thank just you. If we can we move just, just if I answer these questions, yeah. talking about the future, about jobs, we just created a new position dedicated to barrier-free travel within our organization. One person taking, taking care of responsible tourism and barrier-free travel. Thank you. I get to take your question. My name is Jill Grinstead. Um, I'm interested if any of the consultants could actually answer my question. That is, in the accommodation sector, is it best practice to combine the needs of the various um, facets, so the, you know, the wheelchair user, user, the deaf individual or the blind individual into one room, or is it actually best practice to create different solutions in different rooms for different disabilities? Brian and then Arnold. Yeah. Um, it, it, sometimes, um, if you're a small business, it, you, you can't do, you can't separate it, and it has to be a particular room. Um, but it, with a, one of the devices that I showed on the screen uh, is the uh, deaf alerter, uh, deaf guard, which is the vibrating pillow pad, and and it, that doesn't restrict you to one room. You can use that piece of equipment in any room in the hotel providing it has an audible fire alarm, it will set that off in whichever room it happens to be in. So in, in some respects, you could have a more flexible uh, accommodation with, with, with more bedrooms where you can offer that kind of uh, choice. Um, so it doesn't all have to be in the one room. Uh, sometimes that does happen, um, but it, it, with, with some, uh, some of the equipment, it can be used in any room, like the door knock device. It can be hung on any door. Is not restricted to one room. Does that help a bit? Yeah. Yeah, I, I guess uh, you know, statistically, we're saying that I think we start to say that 1.2 million people are wheelchair users, 9 million are deaf, and 2 million are, are short sighted. Most of the conversation seems to be around 
it's those yeah. who are in wheelchairs yeah. is, would be my No, I, I, I think yeah. from yeah. Our, I've got that our research that um, mobility <laughs> is the main impairment, <laughs> um, lo looking at England statistics. Um, but yes, uh, only 8% of kind of full-time wheelchair users within that. So I think we're right to add more credence on, on mo mobility. Um, but yes, we may, we may be representing wheelchair users slightly more in today's conversation. Um, but hopefully we've, we've tried to talk across the gambit of, of all different types of impairment. Arnold? I think this country's got a major issue with the building standard regulations. Um, they are not conducive to good accessibility and they are not conducive to good business. I, uh, if I'm training in hotels, I actually encourage... The most important part is the reservation and getting enough information. If you do that properly, you can set up one room to the needs of that person. So you may need to take out furniture, you may need to put in big buttons, you may need to put in a stool in the shower, but you do it because of the reservation that you have and therefore you can make one room accessible for many um, by actually changing that facility according to the needs of the guest that's coming in. Excellent, and we've got a last question from the floor. Yeah, one question. Um, hi, uh, uh, I work in social care, my day job, uh, and I moonlight doing uh, um, travel experiences for people with social care needs. Um, uh, my question is, um, when we discover um, good and bad practice in various places, is there anyone in particular, any body, is it the UNWTO, is it Visit England, that we should report these things to with the intention of building a bigger picture of where good and bad practice exists? And, improving it. Write blogs about it, put them up on the internet and um, build a following about information that you're unearthing about both the good and the bad. And personally, I have no issue with naming and shaming, providing you also name and congratulate. And I think that's really important. Thank you. Um, we have five minutes remaining, but I'd like to wrap it up there. Um, because then that will give us five minutes if anyone wants to uh, grab any of the panellists before they, they, they move off today. Um, we certainly have some good contacts for you here, so please do use the, use the five minutes. So I'd just like to wrap up by thanking all of our panellists today for taking their time out of their busy schedules to, to come and talk to you today. Uh, and thank you for you all for, for attending. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.